What I do in a talk is the talk will last 45 minutes or so. I'll talk about what is an old book, first editions. I'll show off some of the things that I brought tonight, give a little bit of my history background of the store, and then tell some anecdote stories about places I've been, people I've seen, the books, and so on. And then what I like to do in the next 10 or 15 minutes is question and answer, because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. At least with question and answer, I can go on about what you want to listen to. The last minute or two of the talk, I will appraise one or two books to the audience in detail uh, to everybody. After that, I'll end the formal part of the talk, but I'll stay, I'll answer any and all questions, I'll do all the appraisals, I'll just do it a lot more quickly so we can get out of here tonight. I guess the first thing that comes up when you talk about old books is what is an old book? And usually people mean by that what's a valuable old book. Well, the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg <laughs> Bible, let me assure you that it's valuable. Matter of fact, the last time one sold, half of it sold for five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between 50 and 100 thousand dollars on average, and some even more. But any book printed in the 1400s is valuable. Some more than others, but anything in the 1400s. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and uninteresting book then, and it's still a relatively <laughs> dull and uninteresting book now, and nobody will pay very much or, or will want it. On the other hand, you can have some relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is not that old, will sell for thirty or forty thousand dollars. So it's all what people are asking for. <coughs> also, when you talk about old books, we get loads of people who call and come in and say, I have an old book and I know it's an old book, and the way I know it's old is the pages are all brown and crumbling. <laughs> well, I point out that's more lousy paper than it is how old the book is. Now, this is a page from a book called the Nuremberg Chronicle. Uh, I'm actually going to pass this around. Some of the other things I show tonight I won't pass around, but they'll be up here at the front. And you'll see it's not terribly fragile. The paper's white. The ink's black. It's one of the first books done with illustrations. It was printed in the 1490s. So this page is a little over 500 years old. And you sort of say to yourself, well, gee, if they could make books like that then, why don't they do it now? Well, there was a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you had to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You had to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge, and I think it's a very good trade-off. Whenever you talk about book collecting, somebody will come up and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a first edition. <laughs> Nobody wants them, cares about them, or would pay anything whatsoever. A book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, or for some other reason important that there's a group of collectors who want it, uh, and so on. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of literature. Dickens, Twain, Falcon, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and so on. And even within that, there are a lot of things that can make a big difference in the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes. Absolutely pristine. It's if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away. My father got it, and within a week, sold it for $750. At the exact same time, another book dealer had the same book, Mosquitoes Fault, the first edition, um, but it didn't have the paper dust jacket. It had a few tiny little nicks and bumps on it, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $40. <laughs> because a lot of collecting is prestige. 
is to be able to say, look what I have. I have the best. I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have. And people <laughs> who can afford it will pay absolute top dollar for the very, very best, but might not consider spending anything at all for something even slightly less. Other things that can add to the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author is unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed doesn't mean that much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, <laughs> had 50 copies, signed it, gave it to family members. It might mean an awful lot to your family, but it doesn't add much to the price. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, it could add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to the value. In almost any type of collecting that you get into, there are nuances that add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off a little. There are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye, who was reclusive, he lived up in New Hampshire, and other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. Thus, his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value because they just can't get them. Now, this is a little aside from that. Um, sometimes people ask me, is there anything that you wish you were offered that you could have bought or that you didn't get or you'd love to see show up? And there is a letter one time, and this was a number of years ago, uh, a man contacted me. He had a group of letters from J.D. Salinger. And he was interested in possibly selling them, although I was questioned about that. Uh, but there was one letter I particularly wanted. Uh, it turned out he wasn't selling anything. But this one letter, uh, Salinger was writing to him and recounting when he was building his home in New Hampshire. And uh, Salinger said, well, yeah, there were a bunch of high school kids at the time. They came and they helped with the, build the foundation. He said, one of those kids actually was a pretty good athlete. I became a good baseball player, this guy, Carlton Fisk. So Carlton Fisk actually helped build J.D. Salinger's house. I would just love to have that letter. Maybe someday you'll get in touch. Uh, in any case, uh, so there are some authors uh, that, you know, that are very hard to get. On the other hand, there are others who signed a lot of books. There was an author, a local author, maybe some of you knew him or have his books, wrote wonderful ghost, see buried treasure, pirate stories of the New England coast. His name was Edward Rose Snow. Now, Snow was a friend of my father's, and I knew him. And I remember one day he came into the store, and he told us he had been just on Cape Cod. He'd gone into a bookstore that he had never been in before. Snow went right up to the section where his <laughs> books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up, and exclaimed, my, a rare, unsigned copy. <laughs> and then he took out a pen and signed it. And then he introduced himself to the owner of the store. So books signed by Edward Rose Stone don't add as much to the value. Uh, a number of years ago, my father had a copy of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. Now, just opposite what I was saying before, it was a first edition, but it didn't have the uh, paper dust jacket. Um, and it was uh, okay. well worn and read, but when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now, in addition to that uh, inscription, when T.S. Eliot read the book, he made marginal notes, annotations, comments, crossed things out, added things in to just about every page of the book. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even $400,000 because of the great association. One last story about autographs and signed books and so on. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in Massachusetts who uh, was one of the best in the world. But when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was 13 years old, he went to London to buy a copy of Frost's first book called The Boy's Will. Very complicated uh, what is the first edition, but he paid a very good price for it at the time came back to Boston. A few weeks later, he met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. Look what I've got. Frost looked at it, said, what did you pay for it? And he told him. Frost said, give me the book. And Frost opened it up, and the front two end papers wrote a two-page description of how to tell the first binding from the second, from the third, from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy, and said, 
Now it's worth what you paid for it. Uh, in any case, let me digress a little, give you a little bit of my background and the history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s. But for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married. My mother had $500. With that, they bought half interest to the store. And it's always been in Boston. People are in Harvard Square on Brattle Street saying, where are you? We tell them we're downtown. When my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street in what was Scully Square called Brattle Street. Uh, and that's where the store started. And to make it even more confusing, the street doesn't even exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And my father built the store with his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge. He was a bit of a character and a showman. Uh, we've had seven different locations over the years, mainly due to urban renewal. But every time my father would move the store, when it was a planned move, he'd move the best books to the new location. Then he'd run sales. Half price dollar, 50 cent quarter dime. Last day of the sale, though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever. And he'd ring a big bell. People go charging into the store, <laughs> grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again. That group would leave. Next group would come in. And he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969. And we were moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can sort of picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team. And on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, Go West, book lovers. Go 5 West Street, Brattle Bookshop. <laughs> they filled it up with books. And he drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. <laughs> now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend of his, told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. <laughs> they told him to stop. He didn't care. He'd gotten his point across. And we've been on West Street since then. Throwing books he, Well, and... Uh, we were first there in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire, and it literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. But we wanted to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. Uh, people who either sold gave us donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. We had rented folding tables. And uh, within a month, we reopened. It was a meager stock, but the main thing was just keep going. And uh, over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is, again, a few doors down on West Street. And it's sort of the old Dickensian style of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general used books, and then a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, first editions, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business, the large old general secondhand bookstore, especially in the inner cities, is a dying business. It's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, read books, buy and sell books. But as particularly in the inner city, property value has gone so high that rent has gone so high that old bookstores, which are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have been going out of business. And in the last few years, the internet has just speeded that process along. Now, like I say, we bought our building in the early 80s, so I hope to do this for years to come. I have daughter, young adult daughters who I don't think have any interest uh, in coming into it the way I did. And uh, I actually, my parents say my first word was book. I don't know. Maybe it was. I'm sure they were talking about books all the time. And then I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. I was going to get a doctoral degree at the University of Wisconsin. But in 1973, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now has been over 40 years. And I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. <laughs> in 
If you would ask me what's one thing I wish I could find, it's a little pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian done in 1827. I know it's small. It will be up here at the end if you really want to take a look at it. But it doesn't look like much. But the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's a classic rarity in American literature. And actually, one of the first copies to ever really be found was in the 1890s on a bookseller's table uh, on the 10 cent table. Another bookseller spotted it there, bought a stack of books so it wouldn't show out. And in 1890, <laughs> sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who were on the side were book scouts. And being postmen, they knew where all the yard sales were. Uh, they bought a trunk of books. Bottom of the trunk was a Tamerlane. Families got involved. They got to negotiating. And after six months, they sold it for $10,000. Now, I don't know if it was worth it. They started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again. But they got their $10,000. And then about 15 years ago, an antique dealer in the Newburyport area died. His whole estate was auctioned. Paintings, prints, furniture, antiques, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They took all the pamphlets, put them in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane and 15 years ago sold it for $198,000. And then one sold a couple of years ago for $800,000. And let me just say, this is a facsimile. <laughs> a lot of what I bring with me are originals, but I don't bring million dollar pamphlets. But if any of you want to take a close look and then go home and check your attic seller's basement, yeah. whatever, if you find one, please give me a call. I'd love to hear about it. A lot of the fun of collecting is going out, it's learning about something, it's studying it, it's appreciating it. I mean, it's really your knowledge that makes something interesting and thus valuable. I mean, someone might look at something and say, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say, that's a broadside that led to the Boston Tea Party, that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence. So it's really that knowledge and understanding and study that makes things interesting and thus valuable. Now, here's an item that on the surface I think is interesting, but the story behind it may be even more so. This is on White House stationery, dated fairly close now, April 11th, 1933. But it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's the most important post, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Signed, always sincerely, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. <laughs> Now, on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It's an ambassadorial appointment. Well, Curley didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which, of course, he probably was. And Curley's response was, remember, this was 1933. He said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? <laughs> uh, now, Curley's opinion of Washington didn't change over the years. We also have about 10 letters that he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury Prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison, and he wrote to his wife. And he said, many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. In any case, and enough, enough for Curly. Not everything we get are uh, books, but we get brochures, paper material, ephemera. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series where the Red Sox played the Giants. The Red Sox won the World Series in 1912, won a few more times in the teens, and then we had to wait. But then it's been good. Well, last year wasn't so good. But it's been good uh, there, and we have uh, hopes for this, this year, too. Uh, matter of fact, my wife's at the game tonight because I couldn't go. <laughs> uh, but not only is it interesting as a baseball item, but on the back there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. Collars are two for a quarter. Shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. 
I think they go for a little more for than that now. <laughs> it's also become very popular to go on cruises and cruise ships. I have a brochure here for a ship, tells you how wonderfully built, where to book passage, and anyone who wants to go on the Titanic. <laughs> this is a brochure for the Titanic. And you know, almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. There's also a tendency, when you talk about old items, collectibles, and so on, all of a sudden, everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I like to point out, not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Old Life magazines, for instance. Here's one with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. And the large, large majorities of these sell for a dollar or two, They're very little. There are a few exceptions, but the large majority are fairly, very reasonably priced. There were a lot of them. And we used to have, by a stairway at the store on a wall, a few hundred of the more famous Life magazines. And people would sometimes stop and stare at that wall for half an hour, even an hour at a time. Lost in thought and memory, they loved them for the covers, the stories, the articles, the photographs. They made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right dates. And matter of fact, there was a uh, customer came in, a regular customer, and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II, and it wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? And he said, well, I want to teach my children about World War II. And he thought a nice way to do it would be to get a few of the old lives, look at a couple of the photos, read a few of the articles, and then discuss it with them. Sounded like a good idea to me. I was a little skeptical. He came in a few weeks later, and I said to him, how's it going with the lives? He said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs. But they love the ads. <laughs> and he says, and it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had read everything else anyways. <coughs> I have a lot of other things. Um, in my bag, I have a cookbook from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then I have how to bake eels the common way. <laughs> I don't know if I want to bake them anyway, but that's beside the point. One of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island, every day never knowing what you're going to see, who you're going to meet, the people, the places, the books. And I'll relate a few of those stories to you, and then we'll see about some questions. Uh, I was out, um, and I got back, and there was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called and had some books. I called her up, and she said, oh, yes, my father died in Providence. He has 500 odd reference books. We want to get the best price we can. We're inviting a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 odd reference books sounds like quite a good library. Providence is only an hour away. I was more than happy to go. They lived on Benefit Street which is a nice old street up near Brown University. I got to the house, it was a large old colonial house. I got led through the house, into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, they had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, <laughs> one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about six months, I bought about 80% of the books I wanted. She was pleased, I was happy, and she said, my mother has a lot of books. <laughs> Most are being given to the university. Some are being sold at auction. But would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. And uh, I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this day. <laughs> and one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family, and at one point wandering from the basement to the attic all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go here, don't touch this, but just literally wandering through the whole place. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I go to groups like this, I do hundreds of free appraisals. 
Matter of fact, one of my goals is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me in the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, just as long as we're one of the 10. We have cards here, we have 800 numbers, websites, whatever. But there are, uh, one of the ways I feel I can do that and get people is by giving out as much free information as reasonably possible. But every once in a while, someone needs a very formal written appraisal for insurance, estate taxes, and so on. And then I discuss the fee. In any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. But it was a day-to-day -day accountings of the ships, and they were fascinating to read through. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an immense amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. <laughs> and that was the last you heard of the captain. So it's a little different now. When my father was still alive, and he died almost 30 years ago, um, we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, what she had, who she was. But it sounded like there might be some interesting things. She lived in Sharon, so it was fairly close. We got out to her house. It was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling. Weeds were growing. You sort of say, oh, gee, what's going to be here? She answered the door. She was quite elderly. We walk in, and there are just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. It turned out she was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He'd escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being essentially Russian nobility in Europe and all the court intrigues and all the goings on. How T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time. How she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle. But there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy. But the stories were absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And when we first got into a house, on one of her walls, she had 10 watercolors. They were about this size, pastoral European scenes. And when I first saw them, I thought they were nice. And the more she talked, and the longer we were there, and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, you know, those 10 watercolors, they're really nice. And she sort of turned around and said, oh, yes, they're all Turners. Yeah. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paintings. And it was like, oh, yes. So you never know what you're going to see, the people, the places, the characters. And matter of fact, speaking of characters, about 10 or 12 years ago, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to give a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo's a whole lot further than that nowadays. <laughs> and here's a man who can tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. He said he was a young man really looking forward to the learning and insight that he was going to get from these two men. He got to the table a little bit early. He said five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was quite elderly. He had one of those big horns for hearing, sat down opposite them. He said the first thing Ford turned to him and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Carter's little liver pills. <laughs> this man said all night long, all they did was yell about Carter's little <laughs> liver pills. And he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. Uh, I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more, and then we'll see about questions. We get hundreds of phone calls at the store, people wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist, or what's it worth? How much is it valued? And most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer off the top of our head. Some are a little more involved, and occasionally you really have to do some research, but that can be fun. 
But every once in a while, you get a call that really stands out. And this was, again, a while ago, but I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Lady, elderly, very thick Irish brogue, and the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. <laughs> now, you have to admit that gets your attention. Uh, stopped, and she waited for it to sink in. Then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. She had been his nursemaid. When he was three and four years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. And she wanted to get an offer on them. I was skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. Um, I went out to her house. She was great. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer on them, much as I suspected. There was no way she could sell these letters. They were too much a part of her life. I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them. Maybe someday I'll hear about them again. Who knows? But uh, they're probably where they belong. Like I say, I can go on and on and on, but why don't I see if there are some questions? And quite honestly, anything you ask me, I can go off on a tangent. Uh, so does anyone have any? Yes, in the back. Um, what was your most exciting find at the Yancey's Roadshow? Uh, the question is, what was the most exciting find at the Antiques Roadshow? You know, that's really a tough question to answer because there's been a lot of interesting things. There are a lot of things that never make it to air. Um, I mean, a number of years ago, I appraised a bunch of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright material that someone had had a, a house built in Omaha. The, the woman acted as a general contractor at the turn of the century. She even told him that she didn't like his design and to change it, and he did. It was early in his career. Uh, another person had uh, a signed photograph of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, you can watch this week's show in a signed, uh, inscribed copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, inscribed to her editor, uh, which was a lot of fun. But I'll tell you one thing on the Antiques Roadshow. I'll tell you one item that when we do the show, and I'll talk about the, a little bit more about that at the end, but we don't get any pay at all. They don't pay expenses. They don't pay travel. They don't pay hotel. They don't pay anything. So. We want to get on TV when we go, and there's no guarantee because if someone during the whole day that you appraise doesn't come in with something good, you don't get on TV. But the ideal is that around eight, just eight or nine in the morning, someone comes in with something really good, you pitch it, they say yes, you get on, you've been on at nine in the morning, it makes the rest of the day go easily. You're not worried at four or five or six in the that you're not going to get on. Anyways, man came in, and this was in Kansas City. And he had a few things, uh, a couple of little notes signed by Pope John Paul, but nothing special. Some rosary beads he said the Pope gave to him. But you know, it, how could you tell that they really were? Anyways, but then he pulls out some photographs of him and the Pope. Turns out he was the pilot who flew Pope John Paul all around the United States in the 70s. And so, you know saying that's nice and then there's one photograph it's showing you know normally when someone's with the Pope and the Pope is all in his uh, vestments and all that you know he has his hand out you kneel and kiss his ring and you know very subservient but you know he's the Pope in any case this man's the pilot he's sitting in the pilot seat the Pope is literally <laughs> standing on one knee reaching over his shoulder signing his Bible. I said, this is great. Let me see the Bible. And he said, well, I didn't bring that. <laughs> now, this is a Bible signed by the Pope who is now going to be a saint. And, and he goes, I, I, can you get it? Oh, no, it's in a safe, locked in a safe device. And I'm going, how could you come with the photograph? And, because it would have been a, a great. And then he had all sorts of stories. So that's one item that I would have loved that didn't get there. But, uh, you know, and sometimes it's even things, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, we were praising towards the end of the day. I had already been on television, so my colleague had, and we, we share that way. I, before I get on twice, someone walked in and put it down in front of us, a letter of Galileo. Uh, I mean, it's a real, original, authentic. Really? It's, you know, so... You never know. In any case, like I said, I can go off on tangents. I could even talk about some things that I've actually 
the, the, a couple of things that I've appraised that you sort of get excited about. Now, these aren't things that I've owned. So, but I got called by a historical society to do an appraisal. They were loaning some things. And I said to them, I'll do it for free. I do them a lot of favors, but I don't want to do it from your website, from a copy. I want to hold it. Four-page handwritten uh, description of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. I mean, holding it there. An another time I got called, and we had no idea what we were getting called to appraise, but they said, could you come down? I said, sure. My manager and I, we get, you know, an industrial-type building, get led into the basement. There's a table like this. There are three documents sitting on the table, the Mayflower Compact, the Pilgrim Charter, and the Bill of Rights. And I sort of got to go like this. They're now in the State Archives Museum. This was just before they built their museum, and they were having to take them up to get some restoration work. They actually closed down Route 93 when the car was going up in a motorcade because they didn't want to take any chance that somebody would hit the car. But, you know, I mean, it was, it was the Mayflower Compact. It was, you know, four-page handwritten accounts by Paul Revere. They exist. In any case, any other question? Yes. So who is it that's buying the, the mid-value books today? I mean, is there still a strong market? The question is, who's buying the mid-value books? And is there still a strong market? Quite honestly, the mid-value has become the low value. <coughs> the really high end of no things in autographs, manuscripts, books, the truly rare, the truly, in, it's still doing very well. Um, but the mid-value has dropped a lot, partly because people who can afford to be in the mid-value, especially when the economy went, goes down, they're the ones. But also, even more so, the internet has made a lot of things that were, quote, rare a number of years ago. They actually weren't rare. They were just hard to get. Now you go, where you, you know, where you might wait years to find something, now you go click, click, a hundred copies show up. They're really not rare. The price has gone way down. Uh, it's also interesting, when you talk about the high end of books, uh, you know, it's still, even the best collections of books, when someone spends $120 million on a painting, uh, there's one book collector, and he's one of the really major book collectors, and it's sort of, he asked, why did you decide on books? He said, well, I figured I could spend $10, 15000000 million on books. And with that, I could be one of the major book collectors in the country. He says, with that money on a painting, I could buy a sketch of some famous uh, <laughs> artist and really have nothing. But I could be really important. So you know, books still, but the really top, top things still do get good prices. But the middle has really hit taken a hit like that. <coughs> uh, anyone else? Uh, uh, yes. Well, can we call you and do you make house calls? Uh, well, I mean, that, that's like a, <laughs> asking me to, to give you an ad, but sure, absolutely. But uh, I mean, the, like I said at the beginning, the most interesting part about the business is going out, and I do it almost every day. Uh, sometimes it's good books, sometimes it's just, I mean, the other day we bought 3,000 cookbooks in Lexington. Uh, another time we get called to buy sporting books or fishing books or just general books. And then every once in a while you get called to buy some really rare. But that's how a used bookstore needs to get books constantly in. And one of the things, when people call uh, about selling books, the first question we ask is about how many. We don't mean count, but about. And uh, what type of books? And, you know, I mean, are there a lot of books? If, you, if someone called me and said, I have 200 books on the history of Belmont, I know they're good books because nobody can have 200 books on the history of Belmont without really searching and going after everything they can find. Whereas if they say, well, they're a little of everything, well, then, you know, probably they are a little of everything with nothing precise. So that. Now, nowadays, Actually, another thing that people do a lot of times, they'll call, they'll say, we have a lot of books. Uh, how do we give you an idea? Well, if you have a, a wall of books, nowadays, if you take a digital picture from here and it's in shop focus, I can probably tell what 90% of the books are, and I can tell very quickly. And it's a great way to start the conversation. 
But yeah, either through the web page, the calling. I mean, that's what we do. That's that's the fun part. And yes, we do go out all the time, depending on how far it is. If someone calls me from New York City, I might ask more questions than someone calling <coughs> 10 minutes away in Belmont. But we still will ask a little. Uh, so yes, we do it all the time. Uh, did you have a question? Or? Oh, I was wondering about magazines, um, if they're in excellent condition and they're old. Uh. Well, the question is, what about magazines in excellent condition and they're old? Depends on what magazine. <laughs> it depends on the definition of what's old. For some magazines, some dates are better than others. Uh, it depends on when the magazine started it. And then there are some magazines that actually the older ones are not the most valuable. Um, there's uh, Harper's Bazaar, which is a fashion magazine. In the late 1800s or mid-1800s, 1870s, 80s, they were black and white. They were nice. They show you the fashion of the time, but they're not, they're nice, but the fashion isn't in style. In the 19-teens and 20s and 30s, they were, the fashion, they had colored covers, they were beautiful of the fashion from the 20s and 30s. Those people are dying for. And they go for big prices, whereas the ones that are 40, 50 years earlier, they don't want. And actually, in many things, now Victorian style is out in mid-century, 19 post-World War II is in. So I'd much rather sometimes to get that era than the Victorian era. So it, it depends on what's in, depends on what's old, it depends on you know, baseball magazines. You know, if you get back to the World War I, turn of the century, those are really, really old. But you can go up a lot further and still be good. Uh, I'll tell you what, at this point, why don't I do, you had a question? question. I'll do one more, okay. sure. Science books, like chemistry books, or like manual medical books, do those have any value, the older ones? The, the, the question is, do science books, the Merck manual, that type of thing, do they have any value? Uh, some of them do, some of them don't. The, the, one of the things the internet has also done, any book that you bought purely and simply because you wanted the information, you wanted it on your bookshelf, like a Merck manual, like an encyclopedia of chemistry and physics, they're worth nothing. Right. As a matter of fact, they're barely used anymore. But when you talk about science books, you can get back, I mean, Isaac Newton, you can get back. Uh, but they don't all have to be that old. You get uh, into the 1940s during World War II on books on computers, those are great. And there are some titles in the science books, uh, you know, the discussion of electron holes done in the 50s. Well, that's the first books on transistors. So there are many that can be of value, but if there's sort of the pure textbook, so on. Probably the more that you read the title and have no clue what that book is about, the chances are it's probably better than introduction to, or introduction to, or whatever. So it, it, it really depends. Matter of fact, one of the uh, things that I'm looking forward to is uh, in a few days I have to go out to a library. It might, the books might or might not be good, but the man well won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. So I thought it would be really, I've met a few Nobel Prize winners, but since I studied chemistry, Got nowhere near that point, <laughs> but but it would be interesting to meet them. Tell you what, at this point, why don't I do one or two appraisals? Did anyone bring a Bible? Um, okay, well this one even is fine. Did anyone bring a Victorian style book with a decorative cloth cover, really sort of pretty popping type? Uh, if if someone has something a little more. 1888. It's more. I'm looking for the cover, the decorativeness. Of, uh, that's leather. I'm looking for cloth, uh, and if just in case I brought one, because it's not about the books, it's about the story that it leads to. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just, why don't I do that one? Uh, that will give an idea. Anyways, well, th this will do. Uh, uh, in any case, first let me say something about doing appraisals. Uh, when I do appraisals at groups like this, I usually give a retail price. In other words, that price that you would pay if you came into my store or a store like mine. It is not what you would get if you're selling the books. Usually if you're selling the books, you'd expect to get about a third to two thirds of the retail. If you're dealing with the low end, the markup might even be higher. You've got to make some money. 
And when you get to the very expensive, the percentages can come down. Uh, a number of years ago, I bought a copy of Audubon's Quadrupeds, not the birds, but the animals, but the big, huge, 150 or so hand-colored plates. At the time, I paid $100,000 for it. I sold it within two weeks for $105,000. It's only a 5% markup, but it's $5,000. Well <laughs> worth the time and effort I spent, and I pretty much had it pre-sold before I bought it. So when you get into those much higher prices, especially for things that are going to turn over quickly, the percentages can come down just because the amounts of money involved are so much more. Also, everything I say is subjective. In other words, the fact that I say something's worth $100 doesn't mean a colleague of mine might not say 100 and a quarter and another colleague say 75. So if you know what you have, you go to somebody, you get a price, you're happy, great. If you're not sure, get a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. It's almost more a matter of how much time and effort you want to put into it. Well, the first book that was brought up is a book on Rome. Uh, it's done in the 1880s. Um, it has some nice black and white illustrations in it. Um, the cover is nice. It's a little bit worn on the top and bottom. It's basically a coffee table book from the 1880s. Um, the fact that it's a little worn actually makes a big difference. It, this would probably sell in the $25 to $50 range. In mint condition, it might sell for $150, $200 because a lot of times someone might buy this for someone who's moving to Rome, someone who's been in Rome, someone going to Rome, but they, if it's mint, it looks like a great gift. If it's a little used, it might look like something you just took off your shelf and sort of re-gifted in a way. Uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, and my other example, and I'll actually hand this one back, is before they had dust jackets widely used, and they go back to the eight, early 1800s, but the dust jackets as we know them go back to around World War I. It was a matter of printing. But before that, they used to have a lot of books with very decorative cloth covers. And the realized, real reason they had those decorative cloth covers is that the publishers figured if you walked into a bookstore and the book caught your eye, better chance you'd buy it. And there are people who collect books like this just for the decorative covers. Yours was worn a little, which is another reason why, if it had been in mint condition, that cover would have just popped out in all the decorations on the side. But there are people who collect this. And you can go to the library book sale, yard sales, uh, friends-sponsored groups, and pick these up for relatively little bit of some money. There are some that are very expensive, but you can put together a collection that individually might not seem like that much. But as a collection, graphically, it can be great. And matter of fact, I have a collection like this myself that started off as a bit of a joke. I got a book in, it had a picture of a toilet on the cover. And the title was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper. <laughs> the toilet. Anyways, I brought it home, I showed it to my wife. She took one look at it and said, we have to put this in the bathroom. Yeah. So we did. A couple of days later, I got another book had a big eye staring out of the cover. Title was We Never Sleep. It was a history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But with a big eye staring at you, I said, ah, put that in the bathroom too. <laughs> now, this is a little half bathroom, so there's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves. Now we have three or 400 of these Victorian style <laughs> illustrated books in our bathroom. Uh, people walk in, they're a little taken aback, but loads of reading material. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable, because of course every once in a while a book falls off the shelf, and you can imagine where it ends up. I like to end the talk talking about Bibles, and one of the reasons I like to do that is the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time, always has been, probably always will be. And we sometimes get five and ten calls a week with people who have 100, 200-year-old family Bibles. And in most cases, we have to say, if this is your family Bible and it's been handed down through the generations, sentimentally, it's priceless. But monetarily, it might not be worth that much. Now, there are exceptions. There are the Gutenberg Bibles. There are others. So always check. And also those big old Victorian Bibles with the beautifully embossed 
covers and the clasps and so on. Mint condition, those can sell hundred, two, three hundred dollars because they make wonderful gifts for ministers, priests, divinity students. But break one class, have one hinge go, they lose all that value. Uh, many times in those Bibles, so the beginning, the middle, the end, there's a whole list of family history, the births, deaths, marriages. Those can be invaluable to the local historical or genealogical society. But many times they just want to Xerox out that page, maybe the title page. They don't want the whole Bible. Now this one, is this a family Bible? No. Is it, it's not a family. Uh, this is one uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. It's worn. Nothing wrong with the Bible being worn and used. But there's really no real monetary value to it. Um, it's it's nice, probably ten dollars somewhere in that range. Someone uh, gave it to me, and they bought it at a shop uh, that where they bought it. Yeah, well, that's the type so. of thing. If we had it in our shop, we'd put it out at ten dollars. Someone would buy it, but it's not it's not a valuable one. Uh, one of the things that I said that I talk a little about, and then I can hook Bibles into this a little, is uh, Antiques Roadshow, which I do appraise, and I am on this week. Uh, doing a, a sign uh, to kill a mockingbird from Birmingham. Last week I did a whole series of Bill Clinton letters uh, where he was uh, talking about uh, getting hurt and hopefully getting out of the draft and so on. He was in college and uh, it, they were interesting and, uh, and how difficult Arkansas politics were and so on. Uh, in any case, but the way that show works is you do it at a convention center on a Saturday uh, you, there's tables are in a circle. There are three book appraisers next to music, next to jewelry, next to porcelain, next to all the way around a big circle. You appraise from about 7:30 in the morning till sometimes 8, 8:30 at night, pretty much straight through. There are usually around 5,000 people come to a show. Each person has two items, so there's about 10,000 items that come in. They tape around 50 to 60 items. Uh, a few get edited out for one reason or another, and that's what makes up three hours of television. Now, of course, when I say that it opens at 7.30, the appraisers, we have to be there even a little bit earlier. Um, in one of the cities, we were sitting there before it opened, and we said, how many Bibles do you think we'll see? <laughs> so we counted 75 in one day in one city. Now, matter of fact, now, depending on who the other appraisers are, sometimes we have a pool going, uh, but that, that's another uh, thing. Uh, I'll end on one last story. Uh, I got called to a large old church, well over a hundred year old church in Boston, to do an appraisal. They had a large library and just wanted to know if over the years they had accumulated some books that were worth some money. And actually they had some good ones and it was fun and, and a lot of uh, interesting items. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There are a few more books. I looked at the books. And then there was a closet. It was almost more like a small room. It would have been the area sort of where this piano is. And the priest opened the door front to back, top to bottom, floor to ceiling. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. <laughs> and I looked at the priest and I said, you know, what is this? And he says, well, you know, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, throw it in with the rest of them. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That just wouldn't be right. So I use it as an example to say, if you want to give something to a charity, Ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, it's great. But if all you're doing is taking your own, you're really not doing anyone a favor. Now, let me just say, the way I do the appraisals is more, I'll end the talk in a few seconds. I just do it in a crowd scene. The, the less order there is, the faster it goes. If anyone has a big stack of books I, and there are people waiting behind you, I might do one or two of them and ask you to go to the back of the end of the line. I'll do them all. But it's not fair to keep people waiting. Uh, I have business cards, 800 numbers. Never feel you're bothering myself, the people I work with. We'd rather have 100 people call with nothing special 
than to have the hundred first person say, I just threw away a tamalane. Uh, and like I say, the way I do it, so thank you very much. And just bring the books up and I'll just do If you want to listen, if you want to listen over my shoulder to what I'm saying, great, but that's the way I do it. So just bring them up and look at them. Yeah, it's a magazine. Uh, the, 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 if they have beautiful covers, uh, and usually, yeah, but it's more the covers that people really like. Uh, this would sell for about a hundred.